Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Martin. I'm a software engineer at Protocol Labs in the DP2P team. And um, same here, Max, uh, also software engineer at Lippy2P. So, Lippy2P. What, what do we do in Lippy2P? We mostly deal with connections between, between nodes. Uh, connection is a point per point connection between two nodes. Uh, we have a lot of different um, def lot of different connection options because there 's no one size fits all as we will as we will explore in this talk um, so nodes offer different connection options to be uh, to be widely accessible to the network and uh, connections are we, we use multi addresses to um, for for addressing nodes and you can see here um, a multi address for TCP and a multi address for for quick um, just very very quick uh, recap what um, what a lip 2 p connection is. It provides security. There's no such thing as an unencrypted uh, lip 2 p connection. So we run a handshake, which gives us um, gives us the encryption, and uh, we know the, the remote's peer ID after the handshake. Um, it, it, a connection is also always um, always stream multiplexed on um, it, for quick. You get this for free because quick has streams at the transport layer. Um, for transports that don't have streams at the transport layer, we do an upgrade process and use a stream, stream multiplexer to provide streams to the application. So every time an application uses a LIP2P connection, it looks like it, it just has the streams. And we deal with all the complexity below that. So I've, I've shown this, this table a bunch of times uh, over, the last, um, over the last half a year. And it looked very different when I started doing this presentation. Uh, there was a lot more red there, and I'm very happy to report that we are, we've made a lot of progress in the last half a year. Um, so let's go, go through it. Um, the most basic connection option is TCP. We've supported, LIP2P has supported that for, I don't know, since, basically since, since the very beginning, six years, seven years. Um, so that, that works. That works in Go lip 2 p It works in um, Rust lip 2 p It does not work in the browser, though, because the browser doesn't allow you to establish a, a raw TCP connection. The browser allows you to, to establish HTTP connections. That's what it does all the time. But it doesn't give you access to the, to the underlying TCP connection. Similar for Quick. We added Quick support um, a little bit later, maybe four years ago now. Um, it's been in, in Go lip 2 p we are very soon getting quick support in Rust lip 2 p so that's very exciting. But then for browsers, same problem. The browser does quick connections as part of HTTP 3, but it doesn't give you access to the underlying quick connection. So what do browsers, browsers use instead? Um, there are basically three protocols that browsers can use, and um, we'll take a look at them today. Um, the first of them is, is WebSocket, and we've also supported that one for many years in, in lip 2 p But for reasons we'll, we'll discuss later, this has always been a fringe use case. Um, there's a new, um, a new tr transport protocol around called WebTransport, um, which is now supported by Go lip 2 p as of the last release. Um, and there's WebRTC, uh, where we have... W um, we have been working on this for, um, for the last six months, and we've made a lot of progress, and we'll be shipping that very soon. More, 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 more of that later. So let's have a look at WebSocket. WebSocket is a pretty old protocol. Um, the RFC is for, from 2011. Um, basically, what it, what it allows you to do is to take an HTTP connection in the browser and to convert that into a full duplex connection. Um, so basically what you do is you, you establish the HTTP connection to the browser, ask the browser, hey, can we, can we upgrade this connection to, to, to WebSocket? And then the browser, th that's the request uh, printed down here. And then the browser can say, like, yeah, I'm OK with that. Um, let's, do, let's do WebSocket over this connection. And what this means is that instead of um, doing HTTP requests and responses uh, on, the, on, on the connection is that you get access to like a, a full duplex connection. You can send bytes, um, the browser can send bytes, the server can send bytes at any moment. So basically exactly what we need to, to run lip 2 p on top of WebSocket. 
So why, why haven't we, we been using this a lot more? Um, the problem is that browsers, well, it's not a problem. It's, actually, it's pretty nice. Browsers uh, make everything, make, make your connection secure. And the web now has, has moved to almost 100% encryption. Um, specifically, what that means is that if you, have, if you load a web page over an HTTPS connection, over an encrypted connection, it will not allow you to do unencrypted WebSocket from, um, from that web, web page. If you do that, you get uh, this beautiful error message there. Um, nope. So what's the problem with that? Um, to do an encrypted WebSocket connection, you need a TLS certificate. Like the server needs an, a, a TLS certificate. And mo to, to, get an, uh, to get a TLS certificate, you need to contact an, a, a certificate authority like Let's Encrypt or um, there are a bunch of other ones around and you need to get, uh, you, you need to get the certificate from there. Um, even worse, uh, most uh, certificate authorities don't give you a, a certificate for an IP address, uh, but they require um, a, a host name. Now, most LIP2P nodes on the network, it's just people running their node. They, they, they might not even have a host name, and we don't want to tell, tell people, like, you need to go to the CA and get the cert certificate and then somehow configure your node to use that certificate. So WebSocket has always been this fringe thing that a few people who, who really wanted to set, to set it up, they could do it, but then it was not something we could just enable by default. Another problem with web, WebSocket is that it's quite slow. Uh, if you count the round trips, um, you have one round trip for the TCP handshake, you have one round trip for the TLS handshake, um, you have another round trip for the WebSocket upgrade, um, and then lippy 2 p kicks in and takes another th three round trips to negotiate a security uh, protocol and the stream multiplexer. So in total, we end up with uh, six round trips, which is very expensive. Now we can improve a little bit on the lippy 2 p part and not waste so many round trips on, on, on the multi-stream negotiations. We can cut this down by, by two round trips and this will be rolling out um, um, in, the, in, the next, uh, in the next few months uh, in GoLipi 2 p But we are still, like, uh, we, we can't do any better than four, four round trips to set up a WebSocket connection. Now, the new protocol, Web Transport. It's super exciting. Uh, it's still under development, so there's no, no RFC yet. Uh, but the IETF is working on this, and the W3C is standardizing a browser API. It runs on top of uh, HTTP3. Uh, it's always encrypted because it's, because it's quick. And it's, it's basically the same thing as web WebSocket a, a, from a conceptual standpoint. Um, but you don't get access to, to the underlying TCP connection, but you get access to, to, the, to the native uh, quick streams of the connection. So that's pretty cool because you get all the, all the benefits you, you have, um, you have um, of, of quick as compared to TCP. Um, the upgrade works pretty similar. You send, you send a request to the server uh, asking for that upgrade to, to web transport and then the server can, uh, can accept that and from then on um, one, can use, one can use the quick streams. Security wise, the server also requires the connection to be secure. So it's, for, we, for, for the longest time we thought like, oh, this will just be the same as WebSocket. But then earlier, that was earlier this year, I think it was in January, the W3C decided to introduce a new browser API. Uh, it's intended for short-lived VMs that don't have uh, domain names and that don't have, um, that don't have TLS certificates. So it's basically exactly what we, what we had been hoping for in libp2p for so many years. The way this works is when, when the browser knows the, the, certificate, the, the hash of the certificate that the browser will present, it will accept this as a secure connection, just as it would accept a, a certificate that was signed by a CA. So there, there's these two options. You can either give the browser a, a CA signed certificate, or you can tell the browser about the hash before that, and then the browser will just check that the certificate you present during the handshake actually matches that hash. 
There are a few, a few restrictions uh, that come with this. Um, you cannot use an RSA key. Um, that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty easy to work around. Uh, we don't use RSA keys anyway. Um, the other one is that the certificate must be short-lived because they were targeting these, um, these VM deployments. There's a limit on how, how long the certificate can be valid. And we have to work around that in, in the P2P because the, this, the, the maximum validity time of the certificate is 14 days. Uh, we do this by basically advertising multiple, um, multiple certificate hashes in, in the multi-address, as you can see down here. So this all works. We shipped this in the latest uh, Goalie P2P release uh, as an experimental transport, and we'll probably make it a default transport in our next release. Let's count the round trips again. It's a lot faster than WebSocket. We just have to do a quick handshake. We then have to do a, the web transport connect request. And then, we, then LibP2P runs another noise handshake on a web transport stream. So we are at just three handshakes. And with one optimization, that will soon be possible um, when the W3C fixes their browser API, we can run the, the second and the thir third step in parallel. So we'll be down to two, just two round trips to, to fully set up a LibP2P connection. So I, ha I have a, a quick demo of how this works. Um, uh, Marco built this. Marco from the LibP2P team built this demo. Um, there's, a, there's a Kubo node running web transport by, by, uh, provided by GoLibP2P, and he's connecting to it um, from the browser. Um, you see there's the multi-address containing the hashes, um, already established the connection. And he's now downloading a, a CID from a Kubo node directly in the web browser. And I was too slow narrating this. <laughs> but I, you, did you, okay, I'll, I'll do it again. <laughs> so here's the, the multi-address, connected to the node over web transport, downloading the CID, directly from the node, there it is. Also, this is real time, right? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't speed up the video. <laughs> Wait, what's going on? Okay, wh wh what, what can we use this for? And this is just a few examples that we could, that, that we could come up with. Uh, I'm sure that there's a lot more use cases to this. So given that the Filecar network is already running on libp2p, we could, we could um, create trans Filecoin transactions in the browser and directly submit them to the, to the mempool via the gossip sub protocol. So currently, when, when you use an, an application like Glyph to, to, send, to send some Filecoin around, they would connect to a, to a gateway node. You would sign the transaction in your, in your browser, send that to the gateway, and the gateway would then put this on gossip sub to, to get the, uh, the, um, the transaction into the blockchain. Now you can do this, you, can, you could do this directly from your browser and gossip this, this transaction. The same applies to Ethereum, because since the merge, they are now also running uh, on lib 2 p Another thing that, that, is, that is possible now is you could potentially make a Filecoin deal right from your brow browser and upload the, the data um, to the storage provider using web transport. Um, and then it, it, it should also work the other direction. You, could, uh, you can retrieve data from any IPFS node. We've already seen that in the demo. And potentially, this could also work with Filecoin nodes. You could retrieve, um, retrieve data from Filecoin nodes using web transport. So that's, that's pretty cool. But I'm sure there's a lot more. And if you have any ideas what to build with this, please get in, get in touch with us. Cool. OK. That's it. All right, the last one on the list um, is WebRTC. Uh, most people have probably heard the term WebRTC, and most people here probably also used WebRTC. It's quite, it's quite old. Uh, we jokingly say like it probably defi uses every RFC that the IFTF ever standardized uh, in one protocol. Uh, it's initially built for audio and video, so most of you have probably at some point used uh, Hangouts to connect with two people, and you might have used WebRTC there to actually transfer. Uh, the video bytes. Now, 
Um, Lipid is not focused on video or audio, but instead uh, reliable data channels. But the cool thing about WebRTC, uh, the browser APIs actually give us a way to um, send data in a reliable way over these things called RTC data channels. So you can think of that just um, yeah, as a bidirectional message channel where you can send message in and get messages out. Um, for those interested, that runs on top of SCTP, that runs on top of DTLS, and that runs on top of UDP. So now you kind of get a grasp why I say like this combines every RFC out there. Um, cool. So two properties which are for us important, or three. One is this RTC data channel, right? We can send uh, messages between two nodes. Um, second one is similar to web transport. Uh, this allows us to connect to a node that doesn't have a uh, signed certificate by a certificate authority. So it allows us to make a connection to a node uh, where we only have the certificate hash of that node. Cool. And then the second thing, uh, or the third big thing, is that it allows us to do hole punching with the browser. So usually browsers are always behind NATs and firewalls, right? No one allows us to connect to that browser from the outside. So now with WebRTC, we're actually allow, able to connect two browsers with each other. And that's probably also how you had your video call over uh, Hangouts at some point in time. Cool, okay, so that's WebRTC. And now we wanna use WebRTC in Libre2P. Um, and we have two use cases. One is browser to server. And there really the relevant part is like in uh, web transport. We want to connect to a server that doesn't have a signed certificate by a certificate authority. Right? Most of the IPFS network, for example, most of the nodes are just people spinning up nodes in their home network or on servers, and they don't want to go, as Martin described, through getting a domain and so on. Um, so WebRTC gives us that, um, and we can actually do a WebRTC, establish a WebRTC connection uh, from a browser to a server, so a public endpoint, uh, without stun and turn. For those familiar with WebRTC, usually it always uh, requires a dedicated stun and turn server somewhere. But we don't need that, and that's like a great step for lib 2 p to actually establish peer -to in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion uh, connections, as we don't need either of those. Um, for those interested, like we, all of this is based on ice light. Um, this allows us to do multiplexing on the UDP socket, but that's really too much into detail, so. If you want to know more about how we get around stun and turn, uh, reach out to me and I'll explain it to you more in detail. Cool. Um, WebRTC gives us, uh, with DTLS, gives us some security, but we haven't authenticated the remote yet, the uh, lip 2 p identity of the remote. So as in web transport, we also need an additional noise handshake. And then as a status, like we have a specification and that is close to be finalized. And then we have implementations in JS, Go and Rust, and those are uh, pending review. So none of this is merged and none of this is released, but we hope to get that to that at some point soon. Um, cool. So Martin had all the cool protocols where he could count round trips here on the stage. <laughs> I'm now presenting WebRTC, where you probably don't want to count the round trips, but obviously that's a joke. Um, let's count the round trips. It's not that bad. Um, we have a stun exchange. Uh, again, not a dedicated stun server, but just with that server that you're trying to connect to, so still in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Stun exchange, that's one round trip. Uh, we have DTLS handshake, that's uh, two round trips. We have SCTP, um, basically, basically giving us TCP on top of UDP, but more to this, um, two round trips, and then we have a noise handshake, one round trip. So in total, we have six round trips to establish a connection to a remote node that doesn't have a valid TLS certificate. Cool. Um, second use case, so we have browser to server. Second use case is browser to browser. Um, what we want is obviously to, for two browsers to connect. Um, browsers um, can already do that with WebRTC. They can do hole punching, which is great. We just need to make use of it in Lib2P. And we want to do that in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So ideally, at least not depend on any relay servers or coordination servers. Um, yeah. Right now, this is a draft only. So definitely not a pending to be merged uh, specification. Um, as far as we can tell, we only need stun servers, but the nice thing about stun servers, for those familiar, 
the two peers that want to connect don't need to be connected to the same stun server. So this can be any stun server out there. Obviously, we could use the stun Google stun servers, but also many, many companies can run stun servers, and we, we use any of them. Um, we don't need turn servers. That's a nice thing. We can relay everything over the LibDB network and thus still establish connections in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Cool. Okay. Use cases for all of this. So you want to use WebRTC in case web transport doesn't work for you. Because um, in general, web transport will be a lot faster. It's on the newer stack, and it will need less round trips to establish the connection. Now, in case web transport doesn't work for you, use WebRTC. Um, and then for the second use case, which is browser to browser, um, you can use this for so many things. Again, uh, I think our creativity, uh, there's way more beyond our creativity here. The easy and boring uh, use case that probably everyone thinks about is you have two browsers next to each other and you want to exchange a file. Or you have a browser here and the browser in America and you exchange a file in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Cool. And then far, 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 far in the future, I would I really like to see this mesh style where like the conference Wi-Fi is off uh, and we can still exchange files over, uh, for example, a QR code uh, and then connect to each other and then exchange the files in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. But the last one, definitely not on our short-term roadmap. Cool. Should I move on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming to our talk. We have launched a website explaining all the different connectivity options in the P2P because we realized there's, there's a lot. There's a lot of trade-offs. <laughs> um, so head to connectivity.lip2p.io and you will find all the information there, uh, including links to the PRs and um, the ongoing work. And one more thing we have on Sunday, we have Lip2P Day, part of IPFS Camp. So you'll, if you if you liked us talking, and if you want to see other people talking as well, uh, that's a perfect <laughs> venue to have a whole day of uh, talks about the P2P. Cool, that's it. Yeah, I was just wondering. I I didn't see uh, Node.js as like a specific column on there, so I was just wondering if that's. Yeah, also, you didn't see a Nim, Lipidip, Erlang, C++. Oh, that's right. There's uh, a Swift, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this goes way beyond over there. Yeah. Okay. But you're specifically interested in Node.js. Yeah, no, I was just okay. wondering, like, how you were, like, the timeline, or, you know, if, if you go and then rust at the priorities, and then maybe others, if someone else is willing to, or how yeah. do you, like, prioritize things and know which, where, you should think, at what time, when things should land and stuff, yeah. basically. Do you want to answer, or should I? I, I, I can comment on, on TCP and Quick. So mm -hmm. TCP works in Node.js. Um, they have been working on Quick support for the longest time, but as far as I know, it's not merged yet. So you can't do, you can't do Quick, which also means you can't do web transport. Um, I think there's WebSocket support. Um, I'm not sure about WebRTC. We did support some of this, or we are supporting a lot of this. Um, from, from the JS side, from the browser side, and the Node.js side. But either we depend on central stun and turn servers, or we depend on the fact that we previously established a WebSocket connection to that peer. Um, now, if we depend on central stun and ser turn servers, that's a bummer, right? It's called lib2p and uh, not uh, lib2p plus some central servers. And then the second one is if the, the second one where you already have uh, an established connection over WebSockets and then as exchange the SDP, you might as well just use the, S uh, the WebSocket connection. Maybe you get more performance out of the WebSocket connection, but yeah. So that was the, the history behind this. I think it enabled many, many use cases, but we hope for this to enable more use cases at, as you have to configure less. Yeah. Hi, um, you, <clears throat> you had a slide about punching holes in the browsers. Yeah. And I mean, it definitely sounds really technical technically pretty exciting, but is that morally wrong thing to do? Morally wrong? Yeah. Like, because ah. it seems like you're going over some sort of like a isolation or firewall which protects the browser uh, yeah. or protects the user. And if you're going, if you're s sort of like bypassing that, that could lead to disastrous consequences. Okay, got it. Um, all right, I wasn't prepared for this, but I, <laughs> let, me, let me see. Um, Okay, so first off, we're not inventing hole punching for the browser. That already exists in every single browser out there. So if a hacker wants to 
make your node, your browser right now available. If you use one of the major browsers and you download their JavaScript code, that's already possible today. We're just making use of it. Now, whether that's ethically concerning, I would say no, but uh, you might draw the line somewhere else, yeah. So, so I would argue that it's, that it's not, not an ethical concern uh, in any way, because the, the, the firewall already allows you to dial connections from your node to other nodes, right? Um, so, so the only thing that hole punching enables you to do is now dial a connection from your node to another node who also happens to be behind a firewall. But I don't see that there's like a, like a categorical difference between dialing a server that's on the public internet and dialing a server that's, that happens to be behind a firewall. I've got okay. a question then. Um, okay. If we've been talking about payment channels earlier today and yeah. how you could retrieve a file and then make payments as well. If I made a browser to browser connection, would that be a possibility? For a payment channel? Yeah, payment channel and then also retrieving files. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Lib2B will only allow you to send bytes from A to B, what those bytes are. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Ah, yeah, the microphone. Yeah, just kind of related to payment channels, browser to browser, uh, libptp kind of question. Um, you mentioned that all libptp connections are encrypted. Like, there's no such thing as a non-encrypted one. Yeah. Um, could, could you allow for, like, the non-encrypted version? Like, if we're building a protocol on top of it that's got its own security properties, we might be able to squeeze some performance by not having that as a default. So, so the problem with unencrypted connections is that there are a lot of, like, you're running application protocols on top of that connection, and you're running, like, the P2P is also running some coordination protocols on, on top of the, uh, on, on the same connection. So you would want to have, um, you would want to have encryption for, for at least the P2P protocols, and you probably also want to verify the peer's identity depending on, on your application protocol. But if, if, if double encryption is really your concern, um, I would suggest that we, that we talk about, about the protocol you're, you're using and see what we can do. And also to mention, like, browsers know how to do TLS, right? They're pretty good at this. Like, I think you should first prove whether this is really a problem before trying to solve the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Don't want to stop you. Please do. But, uh... All right. Yeah, probably got time for one, yeah, one more question in the middle. Also, we're, we're going to be, I think, around a little bit longer. You can also come up to us later. But please, go ahead. Uh, test, test. Yes, it, it's working. So uh, my question was, it's possible to do TCP and quick over uh, to do, um, LIP2P on top of TCP and quick. What about raw UDP uh, for LIP2P? Lip, is it yeah, so, so, so there, there, there was an effort to, to uh, add um, raw UDP support to, to browsers. Um, I think they started about around 10 years ago, and there was a lot of discussion on that, and then it died down because um, um, people just couldn't figure out the security properties of allowing a browser to send raw UDP packets. So that's, um, that, that effort has basically died, and it's probably not coming back. But TCP... TCP it's not possible also in the browser, no? I mean, my question was You're in general. on the servers, right? Yeah, in general, yes, yes, yes. All right, I'll, ha I'll have a different question for you. Why do you want that? Because in many industries, they see use UDP, raw UDP. For example, I work in air traffic control, and they were using UDP. So if we want to, in the long term, that Web3 is used by everyone, right? lip 2 p is used by everyone, then somehow, like this, raw protocol probably will be nice that they have to bought it. No, on a, on a technical level, why would you want UDP? Uh, it's, it's not about that, like, really. It's just... Okay. I, I don't have any, any particular use case. You're right, because why I quick? think we have many use cases why not to support UDP. And as Martin just said, like, most of those are security related, and then uh, many more from the usability perspective. Um, yeah. So, for example, I think your number one example is how do you stop a replay attack? How do we do condition control? How do you have this on a live network where everyone can pump as many UDP packets into the socket as they want? How do we do that? So, we, we don't have a way how to do that, and that's why I would say we don't offer it in lib 2 
Okay, okay, so thank you. That's what cool. I want to know. Yeah, thanks. Great.